and website. We really appreciate the support. Thank you very much to everyone again for attending, and hope you have a happy holidays. And I'm going to pass it over to Jason Ball. All right, Jason, that should be your slide. Yes, it is. Thank you, Wes. You're welcome. Okay, a quick introduction uh, about myself first. Uh, I'm Jason Ball. I'm VP of Operations, Grantech Engineering and Aerospace. Been in the industry for 25 years now. I've uh, been with the company for eight years. And uh, I've worked in many CAD CAM type systems, including MasterCAM, AutoCAD, SurfCAM, GibbsCAM, Siemens NX, uh, CATIA V5, and finally, uh, CATIA and Delmia V6. Grantech was originally founded uh, by my late business partner, Bill Kennard, in 2001, where he purchased a failing and dying company, basically, with a vision of turning it into uh, something terrific. Uh, we lost Bill uh, in January of this year, and since that time, his wife has taken over uh, as owner been operating in the same location, serving companies worldwide for 10 years now. We basically operate uh, with the flux of the industry between about five and $20 million a year. And lately we've been ex experiencing sales growth about 20% per year. Uh, the best part about what we do is that we've been able to get almost all of our work on long-term contracts with our customer. Uh, both affording us um, some ability to see the future and uh, controlling costs for our customers. We are considered an aerospace job shop, if you will, performing precision sheet metal and machining processing under our AS9100 Rev-C quality system. Now, one of the things that makes us attractive to our customers is that we also do in-house tool design and build we have our own paint and our own uh, bench assembly. Uh, we roughly employ 40 employees. We have six in engineering currently, four in quality, five in planning and administration, and then there's a flux of about 25 to 35 in manufacturing at any one time. We leverage a very flexible workforce in that we cross-train all the people on our floor. Uh, so we could have somebody working uh, in brake farming or hydro farming area for the first half of the day and then switching over and working in our machining area the second half of the day. Currently, we're running one shift uh, a day on a 410 schedule. We're going to be moving to two shifts in uh, probably the second quarter of 2012. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So major challenges that we face, there, there was essentially three major issues uh, that got us to go back and start reviewing what our solutions were and how we might solve the problems. We added on a Moriseki five-axis machining center and a couple of Moriseki Milturn multi-axis lathes. In that move, uh, we were promised working posts and simulations from prior vendors. Um, and after about a year's worth of time, we never received those. They, they were never fully functional. We also were growing rapidly during that time. It was on the upslide of the aerospace industry again, starting in about 2008. And uh, it really started ramping up. At this point, we managed 6,500 unique part numbers we're shipping over 140,000 individual parts per year. So that uh, probably helps paint a good picture that data management was beginning to be a pretty significant challenge for us. We had to deal with revision control, access rights for users, and uh, pushing ECOs on part numbers through our system uh, in the fastest manner possible. Uh, we had many gigs of information stored under uh, Windows platform servers at that time. Due to all of this happening, uh, engineering was falling behind rapidly. We had no way to do or programming and have it be bulletproof out on the floor, so sometimes we were programming parts twice, once in the system that wasn't working, 
and then going back to an older system that we knew we could at least get the work done, maybe with not full simulation and post support, but enough to get it out on the floor. We're also struggling with multiple systems. We had AutoCAD, NX, MasterCAM, and CATIA V5 all in place at the same time. And there'd be different pieces of information across multiple platforms. So not any one person was an expert in all of those. So the work had to get shuffled back and forth between multiple users. Brantech has always strived to be a leader in the aerospace industry. We see it as we're either getting into business or we're going out of business, and we always want to be on that upward trending curve. We finally realized that CATIA 6, Anovia, and Delmia were the key to doing this. We not only wanted to solve our problem, but we wanted to show our customers that we were willing to be leaders in both manufacturing and technology, essentially putting ourselves ahead of our customers and what they were using. Next slide, please. So we got back in touch with IDEX, and we sat down and looked at what we were doing, what we had, and what we thought we needed. Susan Crowden was a big help in helping us understand what was available and what was out there. And what Bill and Susan finally came to the conclusion of was that we needed the full enterprise V6 installation with Katia, Delmia, and Anovia. It solved all of our problems in one complete end-to-end -end system that had the same look and feel from the front to back. So how we did it is we leveraged IDEX to get it done because we had no in-house expertise in V6. We had limited expertise in V5. So for Anovia, we did the exploration as to far as what we could do, what it could do, which essentially it's limitless. We did the exploration. We sketched out workflows of how we wanted ECOs and new products to flow through the system. And then uh, IDEX helped install and set up our database that everything connects to. Software installation, we, IDEX helped us set up the servers and helped us uh, understand how to set up new workstations and connect them back to the server for both software and license management. It also helped us understand what licenses would be best for us, whether they're fixed or floating, et cetera. It's actually a pretty complex process if you haven't been through it. There's a lot of options. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest problems we had is a solid post processor and good machine simulation. With CATIA V6, we leveraged IDEX to help us build our machines so that our simulation was accurate and realistic. We could get the full virtual world that we could immerse ourselves in as we were programming our machines. It takes expertise to do machine building, and we didn't have that, so we leveraged uh, IDEX to get that done right the first time. I think we could have done it, but it would have taken several iterations to get it right. In this case, we got it right the first time. And additionally, I have to give credit to IMS. They are a tremendous resource and a big help for POS. And they are the most responsive POS developer I've ever worked with in the 25 years that I've been in this business. Um, we just had another little change that we needed, and we got it essentially overnight um, from the East Coast, which is excellent. And lastly, we leveraged IDEX for our training. Uh, you know, there was a lot we didn't know. So uh, we got CATIA, Domia, and Anovia, and server user administration training from them. Essentially, we have three weeks of in-classroom type training with uh, many other call type trainings where we called Wes to find out how something works or uh, one of the many other people uh, at IDEX that have helped us along the way. And, and that goes for uh, Dassault folks, too. We've had a lot of support directly from Dassault, thanks to connections that we've made through IDEX. Once again, very responsive, very helpful. Next slide, please. So return on investment, it's always a tough one. And if there's accountants in this meeting, they'll probably beat the daylights out of me. But you know, our, our move was more problem solving and, and strategic than necessarily having to do with 
the exact dollars and cents. But what I can share with you that is tangible is that working posts and simulations took us from, on the average, about 10 program reposts down to about three. And I think, like I say in my next bullet here, experience may drive us down to one or zero. Uh, many of us are still new. Many of my programmers are only a few years into programming. They're all new programmers. And so they're still learning um, as, the, as we are learning the software. Um, we have a tops-down programming approach where we don't do any edits to our NC code out on the floor. We drive the changes back up to the engineering team. They make the changes in Delmia repost the code and send it back out. That way we always get the same code um, showing up out on the manufacturing floor and some kind of change doesn't get missed. We capture all those changes up front. Also, all of our NC code and all of our um, program resources are locked down inside of the Anovia system, which gives us excellent change control. It keeps us very responsible and formal about how we implement changes uh, on our manufacturing floor. And the second bullet I can talk to is zero crashes of our equipment um, over the year that we've been working with V6. Um, we were given an estimate by Mori Seiki on our five-axis machining center that if we crashed the spindle, it would be approximately 50K to, to repair it. <clears throat> we had two crashes previous to switching over to V6. Uh, one resulted in $12,000 worth of damage to our um, mill turn center due to a spindle crash on a move that could have been seen and avoided uh, had it been simulated under, under V6. And the other one was in our five-axis machining center, and we just simply got lucky. The guy stopped it just as it was about to uh, run into the table. Reuse of data. Uh, is critical when you're trying to move to a completely virtual design simulation and setup world, which is our goal. We're heading towards paperless setup sheets where our setup operators out on the floor will connect to the Anovia database. And they will actually get to view and review the tool paths on screen, rotate, take measurements, do anything else that they need to do to get the information they need to set the machine up. But in order to do that, you have to be able to reuse all the stuff that's standard, like clamps, vices, bolts, um, fixturing plates, anything like that. You, you can't be redrawing it or taking or changing resources that are used somewhere else. By having everything in the central vault, you're able to do that and control those resources so that when you go back into a program sometime in the future, it's still the same thing that you saw before. We've also found that making the move to V6 has become a, a somewhat of an attraction for getting new engineering resources. Um, it seems that uh, people want to be able to put this on their resume as a software they've worked with and, and learn the latest, greatest. And so very recently we've been beginning to uh, be contacted by various mechanical and manufacturing engineers um, looking to get hired on at our company which is fantastic. Previously, we've struggled to find those kinds of people. And another recent win for us, and, and we think it's in a big part to our V6 environment, is that uh, one of our major customers uh, recently came and visited our facility, and we demonstrated to them how we reverse engineer the data that they provide us. Um, which is typically hand-drawn drawings that are dimensioned and, and poor to say the best about it. Um, taken that drawing, we've turned it into a solid model. We've saved both their drawing and the solid model in our Anovia database, linked them together through a unique product ID, then created all of our inspection materials. Uh, we've designed all our forming tools, had all our tool paths there, had the flat pattern for the sheet metal part, showed them how we can simulate manufacturing, all of those manufacturing operations, and had it all in a revision control, locked down state. And they were so impressed that about 
two weeks after that, they got a hold of us and let us know um, that they were working on a strategy to consolidate all of their machined and sheet metal parts worldwide uh, into our operation. So really a, a good win for us. Next slide, please. So data control is critical, and doing it the way we used to do it under a Windows file-based system was very time-consuming. With our new part introduction, the workflow is automated. It automatically, due to predefined conditions, routes that work to each of the engineers that need to do their piece on it, tracks the amount of time that they're on the job, and when each one completes it, moves it to the next one. So it's no longer reliant on somebody physically moving it from one person to the next or sending an email or making a phone call. It automatically shows up in their email as a task that needs to be completed. That also allows management, uh, excuse me a second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Also, that also allows management to see the work in process in engineering monitor processing times and look at workloads by each engineer or any way you want to create a report against that data. It's, it's all data that's available and you can create reports against it. And we're currently in process of implementing and developing that right now. But we, we will see the benefit, especially in our ECO process. Currently we're using a PDF signature loop process where a document sits out on a Windows file-based system and it uses an electronic signature process. So each person that has to do a disposition and then a final signature has to access that document two times per activity for a total of about 30 separate touches. Each one of those touches and signatures takes up to 30 seconds to happen. Under the new system, it's just a click of the button. It doesn't, there's no lag, there's no delay and it automatically moves it from one person to the next as opposed to people having to nag other people to sign it off and move it on through. File revision uh, saves approximately 10 minutes per part, at least the way we were doing it. We were very diligent and thorough about our revision control. We would create a directory, we would move files over, we would rename the files, check the revisions, go back to the originals, move them up to the next rev level, and so on. And, and on a larger project, it easily took us 10 minutes uh, to do per part. With uh, the new system, it's just a click and it moves all of the current files or any files that you want to a lower level state and makes the new files the current level. And what that provides us is a historical record, which we didn't have before. Our fear was that an old file could get used. So our process said that we would only keep the latest, greatest file of any particular piece of data, and we would delete the old one. Well, after a while, deleting the old one became a problem because we needed the record. So we had to save those files off, like I said, and then hide them in a different directory with limited access so people couldn't get to them. Now, a user with the right access level can go back in and access as many of those levels as they want and see what the historical record says about the part configuration. And next drawing, please, or next slide, sorry. Thank you. So I just wanted to share uh, some of the projects that we did last year that were maybe a little more exciting. This particular project here was a puck bolt driver um, that a customer called up and they were, uh, they were about three months late on the project. And they asked us if we could make it. We took a look at the, what they had and it was all hand-drawn drawings. So we reverse engineered all the hand-drawn drawings, developed solids in CATIA V6, and then drove all of our tool paths and programming off of that. And uh, what we were able to do then is take all the pieces that we had built from the hand-on drawings and assemble it together, and we caught several mistakes that had been missed in the original design. 
So we were able to communicate those issues to the customer, got an approval to make the necessary changes, and then went out and manufactured the parts. And you see some actual pictures of the parts and the completed assembly there. The whole, both units went together and worked 100% first time. There was zero defects or issues with the parts. And uh, the part on the right lower corner there, the handle assembly, that part has holes coming in at multiple angles and sides. We were able to make that entire part in one setup in our five axis machine with full simulation, which is fantastic. You know, no, nobody had to touch it once we put the block of material in the machine. It came out a done part. We'll move to the next slide. Here's another example. Um, you can see in the top left corner there, there's a, you can see the outline of the stock body, and you can see the finished part inside of that. Uh, it was another super tight tolerance bearing gimbal that we made, plus or minus two tenths tolerance, and we were able to make that with all the features relating to one another in one setup. Uh, first part, good part, which you see sitting on my CMM table there in the uh, lower left corner. And then some of the more complex parts that we've been taking on is the right-hand picture. I didn't get time to get a snapshot of the part because it's already on an airplane over uh, in China. But that was a uh, grounded aircraft hog out out of solid titanium, and there's not a flat surface on that part anywhere. It was full five-axis contoured machining. We were able to program, simulate, and manufacture that part out of a solid block of titanium in about 25 hours of uh, programming time, which for us, we thought it might take longer, but once again, we got first part, good part. We didn't scrap any of our uh, blocks of titanium, which we purchased just enough to complete the job. So we were, once again, really happy uh, with the results we got on that. Next slide, please. So in summary, we feel that the possibilities are endless with the V6 package. It's a solid platform, very low level of, of bugs, and we're getting excellent support, which is exactly what we were looking for. It's enabled us to um, speed up towards our business plan and our future goals. And I think anybody coming from another system that's not even close to this would, would definitely say it's a high initial investment, but the return it takes your company to a level that would not easily be attainable with off-the-shelf standard CAD CAM packages. I've got, you know, I'm living proof that it would take multiple upgrades and iterations of those systems to get even close to what we're able to do now. And the overall cost, if you track all of the downtime and the phone support and the upgrades that you're paying for with multiple systems, it's going to add up to be far greater than what the initial investment moving to V6 would be. There's also a huge benefit in not having to feed two systems for simulation. Um, the only simulation that I know of that gets even close is Vericut. And in order to make Vericut work, as anybody that's worked with it knows, you have to repeat yourself with all of your tool, all your holder, all your setup information has to be fed into that system in order for it to show you what's going on and, and get an accurate result. With the Delmia package, you don't have to do that. It's all inclusive. It's all right there. This is a huge time savings. We never had to feed a Veracut type system, so I, I couldn't articulate exactly what the savings would be there, but I'm sure that some other people could easily put their finger on that. So kind of the, the question is, why not get to the desired state that you want to be at right now instead of going through multiple iterations of softwares and finding out that you're not getting what you want. We were certainly tired of that, <clears throat> and we weren't advancing. We, in fact, we were barely holding place and slipping behind in some cases. So with a complete solution, everything is consolidated into one package. Your data is safe, accessible, and controlled. We see that as a real benefit. It's really enabled us to take on a lot more work without stumbling over the management side of all the data and information involved with that. Well, that, uh, 
that's the end of my slide set. I don't know if we're going to do questions or, or roll on to the next set. I think we'll uh, turn it over to Wes now and maybe uh, do some questions afterwards. Thanks, Jason. Okay, I appreciate thank you. your input. That's uh, a good story to tell. All right. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Wes Russell, and uh, I'm going to uh, take a little time here to uh, talk about and, and also show you um, primarily the Delmia machining applications, but I thought I would uh, start out and talk a little bit about the environment. Uh, first of all, V6 has been out now for about two years. I think we're going on to our third year. Uh, the first release was back in uh, 2009, and uh, with, the, with the V6 releases, uh, the release levels instead of, uh, you know, V1, V2, or R1, R2, whatever, um, they come out as uh, R2009, and then they'll come out with an X version. Um, so now we're up to uh, just recently R2012X was released. And so as a matter of fact... Uh, myself, I just installed it yesterday, so uh, it's actually working pretty well, being as I've had it now for uh, about 24 hours. All right, so a little bit about the environment. Um, you know, we talk about the different brands that Dassault Systems provide. Um, you've heard about Anovia, where we manage the data. Katia is, of course, our design products. And um, all of the manufacturing applications under V6 now are a part of Delmia, which has always been referred to as the digital manufacturing company. And some of the products that we used in Katia V5, uh, namely the machine builder, machine simulation, those were Delmia products anyway. They were just um, delivered under the Katia brand. In V6 now, all of the Katia manufacturing applications now fall under the Delmia brand. Uh, when you install the products, when you receive, uh, for example, the, uh, the PLM Express distribution, you actually get Inovia, Katia, and Delmia all on the same disks. So, um, you know, you choose which pieces uh, you need to install uh, for those products to run. Uh, the environment that I'm running in today, I'm actually running this off of my laptop. I'm up in the Seattle area. Our server is at the IDEX uh, office in Portland, Oregon, so I'm connected to that server just over the Internet. Um, so I'll notice that when I uh, access the database, depending on network traffic, it can, be, it can be fast or it can be slow, but the fact is anywhere I have a network connection, I can connect to our server. So quite often I can access it uh, from customer sites or from hotels around the country, uh, and it works as well as it does here when I'm 190 miles away or so. So there's a number of different Dassault brands. Um, in particular, the ones I'll talk about are Inovia, Katia, and Delmia. And there's others. I had Samulia on there for analysis tools, and, and there's others beyond that as well. The machining environment, um, this slide is actually from a previous release, but um, it still pretty well captures uh, what you're looking at in terms of when you enter the machining workbench. In V6, there is only one machining workbench, unlike V5, that depending on what licenses you purchased, um, it would have, you could have different workbenches that you can actually enter to do machining. There is one machining workbench regardless of the tools that you choose to use for, for programming that machine. Um, so on this slide, I wanted to document a little bit about how the layout of the screen works. You will notice there's a lot fewer icons than we've had previously. Um, the other thing, that the major difference when you look at this is the activities process table here on the right-hand side um, is actually split out of the tree structure. So what we call our PPR tree in V5, 
uh, if you're V5 users, um, you can now, I can toggle the, the tree structure off and yet continue to uh, display my, my process tree, basically, that uh, is where you would access all of your machining operations and your uh, various, you know, NC programs. The machine programming menu bar you see here in the center in the top of the display um, is gives you access to all of the icons that you know basically flooded our displays in v5 uh, we had icons in some cases on all all four sides of the screen um, we we still have a row across the top but all of the machining operations you can access through this uh, machine programming menu bar Somebody needs a little oil in there. <laughs> so again, the specification tree is on the uh, left-hand side, and then uh, down at the bottom here we have what's called the, the West Compass Toolbar, and I'll show you a little bit about what's in there. Um, but basically this is the arrangement, and I want to show you a little bit more about um, how these icons work, how we can condense all of the different icons we had in V5 into uh, you know, a very small uh, menu bar at the top of the screen. So here's basically the way it works. Um, this is divided up into categories, and so I numbered these just so you could see what they are. But on the starting from the uh, left hand side, I have the NC machine control icon, and then we get into prismatic operations, surface machining operations. Uh, surface machining operations, it doesn't separate between three axis and four axis and five axis, it's just surface machining, however many axes. You have turning operations here labeled as number four. Um, all the axial operations. And then there's a uh, tool builder to build tools, tool holders, tool assemblies. So all of the tooling functions you would access through this icon. And then there's a utilities icon that gives us access to other functions. So if I drop into this a little further, when you put the cursor over one of these icons, the icons that contain the rest of the functionalities in that particular category show up. And so um, here you see all the various functions that are under the NC machine control. Um, if I move over to the next prismatic machining operations icon, we have all of our icons for prismatic uh, type operations. You'll notice that these icons uh, are really the same icon that if you're a V5 user, the, the same icons we used in V5. So the transition to go from V5 to V6 for a V5 programmer is actually quite easy because actually once you're inside the workbench and understand the, uh, you know, just kind of the new layout of the machining workbench, the functionalities within that workbench are uh, in most cases the same. In some cases we have some enhancements. And I won't go through all of the different functions here, but just to give you an idea how these are laid out. Under Tool Builder, and then under Utility Functions. Down on the, the West Compass Toolbar, by the way, there was a little bit of a change in, in uh, terminology between V5 and V6. Um, the round disk you see here with the selections on it in V6 is now called our compass. Um, and that compass has different functionalities in it. This uh, West Compass toolbar is unique to the uh, machining workbench. And it has functions to do uh, replays and machine simulations and actually generating your output. So you'll find those functions there. You can also minimize that if you click in here. it'll you know, basically hide those functions inside the uh, compass. Uh, about a release or two ago, we, we had the addition, some other enhancements of a uh, machine programming wizard, which now kind of guides you through when you're starting up a new program. Um, the way that this works is, and again, you'll notice there's a checkbox here that says do not show this at startup. Um, the startup it's referring to is the startup of the machine programming workbench. When you first go into that workbench, um, this programming wizard comes up, and it kind of guides you through getting your program, um, getting your setup started for the program. 
So what happens when you click on one of these icons, um, you'll see these yellow arrows down here, and it actually um, shows you where to access that function to uh, go through your setup. So again, once you've done that a few times, uh, you may choose to turn that wizard off. Uh, here I'm going to talk a little bit about tools in V6. Uh, when we create tools, tool holders, tool assemblies, uh, in V6, it creates geometrical representations, and those are parts, 3D parts. Uh, unlike in V5, where tooling information was simply a set of parameters. So what you see here from my screen is the icon for a tool within V6, and this tool has a representation uh, for the part of the parts of the tool that that cuts or doesn't cut. Um, and you can also add user representations into this as well. Um, so even a simple tool, like in this case, is an end mill. This end mill is an assembly. So the document is really a product, but it's it's a special product because it's no it it knows uh, V6 knows that it's a tool, and so it contains various 3D parts. Um, and again, you can add your own user representations to this. So it it. Uh, its functionality we had in V5, it's a lot more robust in V6. Um, so here when we look at the, uh, you know, a tool representation as well, um, we see that there's a portion of the tool that actually cuts. These are the default um, colors that show up in V6. The interesting thing here is um, I can read in tool data from V5 or I can read data from a spreadsheet, which some uh, subsequent slides here are going to show, and it will actually create this assembly for me. There's some additional functionality in V6 where we can define the maximum wear condition on our tools. So if we look at the, the, uh, the tool data that you would see if I'm going through the interface and creating a tool uh, interactively, um, there's a checkbox here of whether or not I want to define the maximum wear definition. If I do, I can specify um, a radius offset of the tool, um, both for the cutting part and for the shank of the tool, as well as a length offset value. What happens when you define those values, if you look at your tool assembly, it records those as um, additional representations of the tool in their worn condition. So if this tool, if you're allowing this tool to go through some uh, number of regrinds and you know the amount of material that typically is removed when a tool is uh, resharpened, you can allow for that, um, that tool representation in its full size when you buy a new tool versus its, you know, at maximum wear condition. Now, where this comes into play is the information is stored with the tool assembly. Um, at simulation time, you have the option of simulating the tool at nominal size or at maximum wear size. Um, what this gives you the ability to do is if the tool is reground so much, uh, obviously your holder is moving closer to your material, and you can actually de detect collisions with the holder or the shank of the tool or whatever it might be. Uh, when the tool's been through so many regrinds. So that's a nice enhancement that we uh, ha now have in V6. Uh, creating tool holders um, is kind of a similar format to uh, how we created tool holders in V5. Um, there's two different tool holder definitions uh, for a prismatic holder, which would be uh, like lathe type tooling, and conical holders, which can be cylindrical or conical. So the picture that I have down below here is uh, creating a, uh, a conical tool holder. Tool holders like in V5 can be two through five stages, but unlike V5, you can add as many of these different sections together as you want to. In V5, you had one tool holder. It could you know, consist of up to five stages. In V6, I can add an additional um, piece of holder, which is another five stages and another five on top of that and so on. So the outlines that I've created here in red is typically when I create a tool holder, I figure out how to best fit the uh, 
the shape of my holer. So knowing that I have uh, five stages to uh, that I can define, um, I defined you know a conical stage on the end, cylindrical, conical, cylindrical, and another cylindrical to make up the these five stages that represent the basic shape of the tool holder. Um, so once that's done, I can then uh, actually bring in an accurate uh, represent, representation of that tool, whether I, you know, re receive it through a step file or or model it myself or whatever, and um, so that tool assembly can have the default tool holder shape, but it can also have your uh, an accurate representation of that holder. So what you see here in the uh, whatever color that is, uh, kind of light blue color, is uh, I believe that was a step file of a tool, and there's actually a colon in the end as well. So give you an idea how you can put these, uh, how you can assemble these, and of course the from the toolbar this is under the uh, the tool function, and I can go through and this was creating the conical tool holder. Give you an idea how the icons look. So then you can bring in a lot more representations. Uh, V6 supports representations that V5 didn't. In V5 you were basically limited to revolutions. Or if you're creating them in part design, it would be a shaft. Um, all of these representations will work in V6. Matter of fact, uh, on the right-hand side here, uh, there's a HSK adapter that it's adapting from uh, one size holder to a larger size holder. So there's uh, there's a couple of different um, tools that are brought in here, and then I just put a default cutter in the end. Um, but you can support shapes again that. Uh, for user representations that V5 didn't support. I recorded a little animation here, or a little video out of V6, uh, give you an idea of using the uh, dialog box to put together a tool assembly. Uh, it's nice because in V5 you would basically just uh, edit the parameters and kind of guess at what you were getting. And in V6, they've created a nice dialog box here that allows you to, uh, in this case, I'm giving the assembly a name. You can, again, put in a comment field. You can, I can go back to the database, and I can search for and retrieve, um, in this case, retrieving a tool from the database. And um, you can specify whether the tool is fixed or powered, like if you have driven holders on a mill turn, for example. And then, again, querying the database, selecting a holder, bringing the two components together. There's a preview button. So that's a 3D window in the preview. Obviously, here you can pan, zoom, rotate. Uh, if I choose to adjust the gauge length, the uh, graphic updates. So you can make sure you have uh, you know, the correct uh, gauge length value when you're putting your assembly together. Most most V5 users uh, manage their tool data from spreadsheets. Within V5, we could then save those as a common delimited file, a CSV file, and we would run a little VB script to convert that to a CATIA um, catalog. In V6, that's no longer the case. You can still manage your data in a spreadsheet, but V6, through the import or list tools function, can actually open up and display the CSV file directly. There's no reason anymore to uh, to run a script to convert that to a catalog. So from directly from the CSV file, you can select which tools you'd like to bring in. And of course, once you say OK to this search panel um, where you're viewing spreadsheet data, once you select one or more of those tools and you say OK, those tools are then um, brought into your current um, uh, machining process, or your, it's actually brought into the, uh, within the PPR, what we still refer to as the PPR tree, but uh, it's down in the machining cell. And once you save that data to the database, all the tools go back into the database. So uh, again, you come in from a spreadsheet, and once, once the data is saved, and by the way, in V6, the terminology we use for saving it to the database is propagate. 
So once we propagate that to the database, um, these are now tools that we can query the database directly. So it's a very convenient way to bring in your tools and uh, create new tools from spreadsheets. Again, when you bring these tools in, so here we're just looking at them in the spreadsheet, but when you bring those tools in, a, an assembly is created for each one of those. Again, that assembly is a product. It's going to, at a minimum, contain two parts um, with the data for the cutting and non-cutting portions of those tools. So in V6, since all of our data is in the database, uh, there, there are no files to, uh, to speak of. So the, uh, what we considered in V5 to be the process document in V6, we refer to that as the PPR context. Uh, so it's an object in the database that contains all of our uh, machining processes. So the PPR context is created similar to V5 in that um, if I have a part or assembly on the screen and I enter the machine programming workbench, uh, it creates the PPR context and um, links the uh, geometry that I had on the screen to that. So then the uh, PPR context has a link to uh, a part or a product similar to V5. Um, it contains all of the process information as well as a machining cell. Now, one of the enhancements that uh, Mark will talk about here in a bit is uh, in, these, in uh, R2012X is that they've um, improved on the, uh, how that data appears on the tree. So uh, we'll talk about what all goes into that machining cell uh, and how the tree structure, this is an older picture, so it's, um, it would have changed slightly in R2012X uh, for the better. So I noted it here, that one particular change, that in uh, the release 2012X, the machining cell is now the main PLM object uh, for your programs. So it contains the programs for the machine, all the resources that, that are used in creating those programs. Um, so the setup assembly is now a resource that's included in the machining cell. And then um, the data in previous releases, so if I, ha if I was using V6 already, um, and I read that data in, the, the structure is modified so that it, um, it, can, it now uh, changes it to the new structure of the R2012X release. And I tried that uh, yesterday, it worked just great. So. Um, so this is the new structure that we'll see. So within this machining cell, you have a machine definition. Any resources that you may want to have included with that machining cell. So tools, holders, assemblies, um, if you have a common set of tools that stay in that particular machine, that can be stored in that machining cell, and you can reuse that machining cell from job to job. Um, you can also have machining, machine accessories that are stored in the cell. Um, by default, all these are gonna be stored in the database anyway, so you can always bring in um, new resources, but if you have machine accessories that are common to a particular machine, um, if you choose to, you can have them stored within that cell and they can be used or not used uh, on any particular job that's using that cell. So the NC assembly resource and then your uh, machining programs and then of course all the process data. Uh, and I'm going to show you that here in a little bit, but when I uh, generate output, the NC programs for that output are also stored within the ANOVIA database. So you have revision control and everything on, uh, not only on your, um, you know, machining processes within Delmia, but also the output that you generate after it's posted. So again, once propagated to the database, the machining cell can be reused. Um, and you can have either a generic machine or if you build a machine, um, and this is one of Jason's machines, the Moriseki, uh, that you can have in the cell and when you reuse this cell, of course the machine definition comes up uh, for each time you use it. Within the cell, a new, ma new machining cell is created automatically when you uh, 
create a new PPR context, but it, it would be just a generic cell at that point. Um, an existing cell can be inserted, and so there's some icons that you'll see within CATIA, there's a, or with Delmia. The machine configuration view gives us functionalities that allows you to load um, machine configurations. They can be pre predefined. I can also bring in machine accessories and add those in. And I'll be showing you an example of that. So what are accessories? Typically I use them for holding devices. So they can be vices, tombstones, uh, chucks, whatever you use, risers, um, anything that you use in conjunction with your uh, manufacturing setup. So the, the nice thing about these is the machine accessories have defined mount points for themselves on the machine as well as mount points for work pieces, one or more mount points of putting work pieces on these accessories. So for example, the tombstone, you can put uh, you know, multiple mount points for parts on multiple sides of the tombstone. Yet the tombstone itself has one mount point that's at the bottom. So it looks very automated when I say I want to mount the tombstone. Um, it has a defined position where it's going to go on the machine. Now you can, even after you, after you uh, load the accessory, you can choose to uh, skew it. So for example, my uh, uh, tombstone loads at the center of the table, but if I wanted to skew it from center of the table for a special job, um, you have the freedom to do that. So here, I'll go through this live and you'll see how this works in more detail. So let's take a look at uh, my V6 session here. All right, so again, I'm logged into V6. My database is down in Portland. And the first thing that happens when you, uh, when you log in, and I, and I say log in because I not only log into my computer, but uh, in V6, you need to log in to uh, start your session. So your login has a security context that gives each user um, certain abilities on the system what they're authorized to view, what they're authorized, what functions they're authorized to use um, within that security context. Now, a single user, if you want to have multiple security contexts, they could be a project leader on one task, but maybe they're just a designer on another. So um, they could have separate logins for different, um, to give them different abilities on the system. When you first get in, um, I'm looking at a, basically a, the quick start page, which is a, uh, it shows a list of favorites. And uh, so the, the- Hey, Wes? Yes. Hey, sorry to bother you, but uh, it seems like there's something uh, not projecting on your screen anymore. Okay. Is this application not sharing properly or what? It's, it's possible. I, I can see, oh, there you go. Oh, how about now? That's, that's much better, thank you. Okay, found another button. Yeah, yeah, could you start over, please? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's all right. Okay, so this is a list of, um, again, of uh, recent jobs that I had open, and um, these are all active, so if I right-click on this, and I have a contextual menu, I can explore this or I can open this. So to explore it, uh, just give you a, l a little bit of idea here, uh, the Explorer, we typically call this the silver layer, but it's, uh, I didn't open the full assembly. I on, I'm only um, viewing a lightweight representation when you're in Explorer. Now, there's a number of things you can do within Explorer. I can pan, zoom, rotate. Um, if I expand the tree, it's going to, um, now it has to read in, which, so it went back down to the database and it grabbed the rest of the components that, that I can uh, expand my tree. And it'll lay those various components out on this platter. And you can, you can spin the platter around. Um, again, you can pan, zoom, rotate. You know, if I zoom into one of these little, uh, this is a retaining ring, for example type of snap ring, and so on. So 
they open very fast. It will support, you know, if you have a lot of parts in an assembly um, or other data associated to the assembly, you will see it on the on the turntables. And if I have sub-assemblies, I can expand those further and so on. Um, these are all functions available through the database. And so the database is a, uh, it's, you know, a very nice tool to use, especially when you, if you're a V5 user and you're used to opening up a uh, Windows file browser, um, it gives you access to, uh, to data that in Windows you may have had, you know, a hard time finding sometimes. And there's a lot of different search capabilities. So as a uh, V6 user, um, the ability to quickly find your data, whether you created it, someone else created it, uh, what type of data, when it was created, there's a lot of different tools available for search. On the PLM toolbar at the bottom of my V6 window, I have a, a, a search window. And there's various shortcuts I can type in to search for particular objects. If I wanted to find um, all of the tools that I loaded in here, um, my shortcut for tools is NCT, and if I just give it an asterisk as a wild card, it goes down to the database and it finds all the tools that I loaded. So there's uh, multiple pages of tools that I can scroll through. And of course, if I wanted to look at one of these tools, just like I did with the, with the vice, I could right click and I can explore the tool or I can open it for editing and so forth. So it's a very quick way to find, uh, find data. If I wanted to look for a, um, a particular uh, NC job that I was working on, for example, that shortcut would be PPR. And I want to look for one that starts with, I know part of the part number or part of the name. You can enter those pieces and then a wild card. And so in this case, it came up with a single hit. And the icon here represents the fact that this is a PPR context, so this is a this is an NC job, and instead of exploring it, I can ask it to open it. So once I say open, it goes again back to the database and opens up that data. So since it was a PPR context, I'm now it opens it in my uh, machine programming workbench. So here you see the layout of this workbench. Um, again, the activities tree, which is, uh, which is transparent. You can move it around anywhere you choose to on your display. I've got some NC processes in here already. Um, the other thing that you will notice is I have controls here where uh, if I want to view more data in the process list, I can expand this. So we had an icon to select to do that in V5. You can simply expand the tree here in V6 um, quite easily. Over on my uh, left-hand side, I can expand the data that I have uh, inside of this particular job. And you can see uh, what's available here. Um, these windows, you can control the, the amount of uh, your desktop that you that you want to use for these windows, and of course they're transparent as well, so it doesn't, you know, block the screen if you want to see if you have very large part numbers or part names that you're viewing. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the menu bar for all of my my uh, functions then for for machining, you can see those here. And so, depending on what function I pick, some of these have multiple options available. This is how, um, this is a good one because there's lots of functions available for Axial. So you notice if you were, again, if you're a V5 user, these icons were the same, are the same as what they were in V5, just a different way to access them, but it takes up a lot less of your uh, desktop to have all these icons available. Okay, um, I think I'll change here to the, uh, I want to load a machine in for this job. So here we have um, functions that give us uh, access to, uh, again, other functionality we had uh, in V5, similar to V5. So here I'm looking at the specification tree, but if I move my cursor over, I get tooltips, so your manufacturing view, 
your uh, machining process view. Um, those are two functions we had in V5 that uh, they're just in, located over here now in V6. And then I have this uh, machine configuration view, which I'm going to switch to. The machine configuration view then allows me to uh, access to machines and machine accessories and, and uh, how to bring those into your session. So we have a row of icons across here for these functions. I can load predefined configurations or I can simply load a machine and search for the database for that machine. So if I collect or if I select this and I want to look for, um, let's say I have a machine that's a Makino, so I'll just type in M-A-K asterisk, should only have one in there and it finds it and I say OK and it'll then uh, bring that machine into this session. Okay, this machine looks like that. And of course it placed it right on top of my part, so the part's down below there. We'll move that around in a second. I also want to bring in um, a tombstone to place the part on, so that's a machine accessory. So we have an icon here to insert machine accessories. And um, so here I can again search the database for a tombstone. And if I know part of the name, I can do a search for that. So it finds it and I'll load that. And of course since these the machine and the tombstone, they were all modeled at zero, so what, what you see on the screen here is when you first read them in, they come up um, just wherever they were modeled in space. But we have functionality here because all of these machines and machine accessories know um, where their mount points are. There's functionalities in here that uh, easily allow me to uh, place these in the right locations on the machine. So you notice under the Makino machine now that shows up here in the machine configuration view, I can right click over the, uh, actually down here, I didn't want to edit that, I want to go down to the work mount, and what do I want to mount? Well, I want to mount this tombstone. So once I click on that, it takes the mount point of the tombstone and puts it on the work mount of the machine. So on both of those, it happened to be the center of the rotary table. This particular tombstone also has workpiece mount points on one on each side. And so what you see here, now that the uh, Makino has the tombstone mounted on it, it shows that the tombstone has four different mount points for workpieces. Now those workpiece mount points could be used for other accessories as well. So if I wanted to bring in a vise and place a vise at a uh, workpiece mount point, it would take the mount point of the vise and put it on the mount point that I that I choose here. So you can keep stacking these accessories up until you uh, make your setup. In this in this particular case, I'm just going to put the uh, the wor actual workpiece directly on the tombstone. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to go back to my uh, machine configuration here and I'm going to select this workpiece auto mount function. So I'll show this dialog box. So the resource that I want to mount the workpiece to is going to be the machine, but if I click the down arrow I have the machine by itself and I have the machine with the tombstone attached. So since I want to put the uh, workpiece not on the machine itself but on the tombstone, I'll select this bottom choice. Again, if I had multiple accessories, I could choose which accessory I want to add the workpiece to. So in this case, I'm adding, again, to the machine plus the tombstone. And then it wants to know, by default, it's, it's chosen the, uh, the zero degree mount point. I can select which side of the tombstone I want to mount my workpiece to. And then I select the axis system here of the workpiece that I'm mounting. Now it doesn't have to be the, the machine program zero axis. You can have multiple axis systems on your, machine, on your parts. In this particular case, if we look at the part down here, NC program zero is up at this corner of the stock, but in the bottom center of the stock, I put another axis system. 
and that's the AXA system that I want to use to mount this assembly to my machine. So I select that AXA system, and then I'll roll this image around again so we see what happens. And I can say apply here, and it brings my setup assembly, which is the stock and the part and any other you know, fixtures that you may have within that setup, and it places it at the mount point on the, uh, in this case, on the machine. And then if I wanted to shift it around because it, it just aligned those two axis systems, I can select the option here, and I have the ability to skew this then in X, Y, or Z around here. So if I wanted to move it from that mount point, I, I still have that option. Hey, Wes, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, we're, right now we're about 10 minutes over what we'd hoped to go, so I just wanted to find out how much more you had. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll kind of speed it along a little bit here. Okay. All right. So I have some uh, various operations in here that I've already performed. Uh, one of the things that I want to show you is the structure of the tree. If you're, again, V5 users, you'll notice the structure is the same as it was in V5. Um, if I double-click on one of these operations, double-click on this one, It'll open up the dialog box, and you'll notice, other than changes in colors a little bit, uh, the dialog boxes are the same, basically, for all of the, your different machining operations. If you were familiar with them in V5, they're similar in V6. And I don't know exactly why there's a delay here. Although I just loaded this job, it may have to actually go back to the database and grab the data. So that part of it I can't speed up. When I brought this uh, this NC program in, you'll notice over here there's a list of tools that, that were brought in with this job as well. Um, when you're creating machining cells, you have the option to bring in tools, other tools that you may or may not use on a particular job, but you can populate that machining cell with a, with a set of tools for that machine as well. Um, and um, all those tools can be edited, like the tool numbers now can be edited in inside of the um, machining cell. So if you wanted to, uh, if they were stored with a tool number on your database and you wanted the number on a particular machine to be different, uh, you have the option to edit those tools as they're stored um, in the machining cell. Okay, where'd my operation go? Sorry for the delay there. So while I'm waiting for this, um, the um, again the part operations from the part operation down, the structure of this is the same in V6 as it was in V5, um, and of course I have um, contextual, you know, a lot of contextual functions that I can right-click over these and, and similar data in V6 to what what you had available in V5. delay is on that operation. I see it's not up to date.
looks like it's going back to the database for it. But it's not coming up for some reason. So let's try this. Let's simulate the tool path. That should bring it up to date anyway. Okay. So when you go into simulation, um, you have two options available. You can simulate from um, from the CATIA cutter locations, or you can simulate from G-code. Uh, in this particular case, I haven't generated the output yet, so I'm simulating. Matter of fact, I don't have a post for this particular machine, so I'm just simulating from the CATIA cutter locations. Uh, the simulation panel comes up here, so that you you have you know, like VCR buttons, um, rewind, pause, and forward, and so on. Um, the difference between replaying the tool path inside of an operation and using machine sim is the speed at which, and I'll start this simulation. Actually, let me turn on, uh, uh, I'm going to turn on some other options available here. But the, the speed is now in slices of time. And so no longer are you limited to see the cutter at um, particular um, computed cutter locations, but you're actually viewing, you can view the cutter uh, anywhere along its toolpath. I also have an option of turning on a display here if I want to see cycle times or I want to see the, uh, the joints of the machine actually moving. Um, the green bars indicate they're within the travel limits, and it shows you which axes are moving. And so if I adjust the uh, speeds here, I'll turn this up a bit so it moves through. Now in this particular case, I have material removal simulation turned off, and um, it's, I'm just tracking the, the center of the tool in this, play, in this particular case and it's showing how the axes of the machine are moving to do that. Um, you can enter a value in here if I wanted to speed it up more or slow it down more um, or pause it at any time. Um, you have controls for all of that. So I'm not going to play this all the way through. I wanted to just give you an indication of, of uh, what that does. So let me exit out of there. And uh, just quickly, I know I'm running over. Let me uh, close this job, and I'm going to quickly pull up another one and uh, just generate some output so you can see how that works. So let's see. I'm going to search for that one. So I'll open this. And the reason I chose this one is because I have, uh, I wanted to show you how the post-processing, um, you know, how you do that inside of here. If you're using, of course, one of the integrated posts, uh, in this case we have an IMS post for this, and I can select here that I want to uh, generate output for this. So the, the output panel looks very similar to how the panel looked in V5. And I can specify the name for my output. And on my NC program, I'm just using TXT as an extension. And I'm going to execute that. So first it generates the app source. Now it's actually posting. The, this particular post is prompting me for a program number. I'll take the default. Nice thing is here you get messages that it was successful. Um, 
a panel comes up and also gives you the ability to display errors or display warnings. The nice thing about that is in V5, you would have to open up your log files to be able to see those. Um, this gives you a tool that if you have errors or warnings, you can display them directly on your screen. Uh, definitely enhancement. You'll notice the output from that operation went into um, my tree, and when I propagate this data back to the database, the NC output goes along with it. So it's an NC files container that's stored within the machining cell, and if I want to view the programs that were generated, um, there's a log file with uppercase log that's the log file for my app source, and then the post processor generates a log file with a lowercase log that's the log file for the post processing. And I can choose to view these files uh, directly as well. So here's my app source, and turn that off, and I'll view the uh, posted output. Again, all of this data is stored within the database, so again, you can search for it in the database, you have revision control, and so forth. I know I ran a little bit over um, at that, Sean. I will uh, turn it back over. All right. Thanks, Wes. Yep. So this uh, this wraps up our webinar series for this year. Um, thing that's not listed here is that uh, uh, for for the webinars that we've done in this quarter as a uh, promotion for our 15th year in business, we are giving away a space pilot uh, one for uh, one one space pilot for an attendee for each of the sessions we've done this quarter. So uh, following the session, we will send out a notice to the winner of today's session as well as the other uh, sessions that we've done this quarter. So uh, thank you all for attending. I apologize Sean, for running over. We will uh, uh, shortly have a link to this recorded session if, you've, uh, if you missed any of it. And um, I think that's it. Thanks, Wes, and thanks, Jason, for your time. And uh, everybody have happy holidays, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Wes. Yes. Hi, what this is Samarinder. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I have a couple of quick questions uh, regarding uh, automation. Uh, is does it support uh, VB automation uh, as uh, in V5? It does. Um, it's very similar to in V5, with the exception of now you're uh, you don't have files to deal with, so. Uh, when you open things, you're opening database objects, you're not opening files. But other than that, uh, once you're in a particular function, um, it's very much like V5 as far as VB automation goes. Oh, okay. So, uh, like, you know, I start with the VBA, you know, quick, and then I, once it's all done, and then I fine tune it, then I compile it into uh, Visual Studio. So both are going to work fine, right? That's correct. Okay. My next question is uh, on the compass. You know that compass. Uh, have is there any improvement on uh, uh, while you are manipulating the compass? Because uh, if you move it, does it show you any graduation scales around that? Um, like for the angle, for the length. So once you move out or in, you know the length or angle. You know the change, the increment changes on that. I mean, yeah. right now we. Yeah. yeah, they actually added that. Um, it's you're referring to what we called the compass in V5, right? Yeah, yeah.